other things. So make sure you have a bulletin. If you don't have one, you can get it from the welcome table. about joining one and let's go. There are several of those scattered across the city. You can find them on the lower part of the bulletin at Machinde, Seguku, Butabika, Kansanga. Maybe you want to start one in your area. Please talk to me or contact each other office and we can discuss about that. Uh, the jump coordinator
Father, we adore you. We give you worship. We give you adoration. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise. The rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. As morning dawns. As morning dawn and evening fades, you inspire song of praise that arise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name, your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing it loud. Because nothing has the power to say. But in your name, or oh, your name, Jesus, Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name, your name. Your name is a strong and mighty town. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has the power to say your name, your name. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has the power to say but your name. It is your name, God, your name. The name of Jesus, your name. Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Father, we thank you because it is in you we find strength to live each and every day unto glory and unto honor of your name. In you, Lord, we find our delight. Hallelujah. You're all welcome in the presence of the Lord. One more time, amen. I invite you to stand even as we praise the Lord. Just welcome someone next to you and tell them hello. 
with a smile on your face. Just tell him, hello, neighbor. It's me one more time. <laughs> Amen. Just, just, greet, just greet someone next to you. Just find someone you can greet. Hallelujah. I have my mind made up. I want to just ask your neighbor, ask your neighbor, ask them, ask them, say, do you have your mind made up to see Jesus someday? Well, I have my mind made up. <laughs> Amen. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus some. Now you got it. I've got my mind. I've got my mind made up. And I won't turn back, cause I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back, cause I want to see my Jesus someday. Goodbye world. Goodbye world. I'll stand along with you, goodbye pleasures of sin. I'll stand along with you, I made up my mind to go the other way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go the other way. One more time. Goodbye works. I'll stay no more. Goodbye pleasures of sin, I'll stand along with you. I made up my mind to go the other way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go the other way. Now you say, born, born again. Born, born, born again, I'm glad. Born, born, born again. Born, born again. Thank God. What are we born of? Born of the water, spirit, and the blood. Born of the water, spirit, and the Born of the water. Born of the water, spirit, and the blood. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back, because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back, because I want to see my Jesus someday. I am under the rock, and the rock is higher than I. Jehovah hides. Jehovah. I am under the rock. God tell my enemies. I am under the rock. Jehovah hides me. Jehovah hides me. I am under the rock. The rock. And the rock is higher than I. Jehovah hides. Jehovah hides me. I am under the rock. Go tell my enemies. I am under the rock. Jehovah hides me. I am under the rock. In Jesus' name, so sweet. Emmanuel name, so sweet. Jesus' name, so sweet. Emmanuel name, so Jesus' name, Jesus. Emmanuel name, 
Jesus' name. Emmanuel name. So let me rock, me rock about Jesus. Jesus' name, so sweet. Every rock, me rock. Every rock, me rock about Jesus. Every rock me rock upon Jesus, Jesus' name. Every rock me upon the Lord. One more time. Every rock me rock upon Jesus. I've got my mind made up and I want Because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus someday And oh, I want to see him and look upon his face There to sing forever upon his saving grace And on the streets of glory All my cares are past, all my last, never to rejoice. Oh, I want to see you look upon his face. There is a prayer of the saving grace on the streets of glory. Just one more time. I've got my mind. I've got my mind made up. And I want to turn back. Because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up. And I want to turn back. Because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up. And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus Someday Someday Hallelujah Are you glad that you see him someday? Oh, 
doubt that in your presence every fear every doubt is swept away or we find confidence in you because you're our joy and you're our delight Those he saves are his delight. 
Take your seats. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the great promises that are detailed to us in your word. We bless you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the one who saves, the one who restores, the one who saved us. Once we were in darkness, we were lost, we were blind, we were dead in sins and trespasses. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of his great love, sent his son that he would die on the cross so that we might receive pardon of sin and forgiveness. We sit here today and gather here today declared righteous, not because of anything good that we have done, not because we do a lot of good things in our lives, not because we have paid with money, not because we have given gold. It's not because of anything that pertains to us, but it's only because of the merit of Christ. It's only because of what Jesus has done. We stand here and sit here justified because of the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is in our lives. Once we were not a people, so your word tells us, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. You are building us up into a spiritual house so that we may declare your praises and your wonders and your goodness. Thank you for your great salvation upon us. And thank you that we sit here as free people. It was Jesus who told the Jews who believed in him that to anyone who trusts in him, that person shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free. The truth shall set anyone free who believes in Jesus. As many as have believed in Jesus, God has given them the right, the power to be called the children of God. And these are children not born out of a husband's will or a parent's decision or because of pedigree. These are children who are born of God, born spiritually, born by water and born by the Spirit. And such, we are here today. 
And spiritually speaking, we are seated with you, Christ Jesus, our Lord, in heavenly places. We can count the blessings which you have given to us and which pertain to us because of your son Jesus, who we have just sung and said he will hold us fast. There are blessings that follow us day after day after day. And though we live in this world where there are, there are many troubles, there are there is chaos, there are wars, there are rumors of war, there is violence, there are accidents, there are uncertainties, there are dangers. The only sure hope that we have to get through it all, day by day, week by week, month by month, is that Christ will hold me fast. The sure hope that we have is that Christ upholds all things by the word of his power, that God rules and reigns even in the affairs and circumstances of this evil and sinful world. And we long, together with the rest of creation, we, your people, long in earnest expectation for the day that you, Jesus, return and come and set all things right. We sit and we come up with solutions and ideas on how we can resolve the problems that we have. Father, sometimes we do that even without involving you. We think our knowledge is enough, our experience is enough, our ideas are enough, our methods are enough, our techniques are sufficient. We know what we should do. Woe unto us if we would attempt to solve these issues without first looking at your word and thinking about what the gospel has to say about all of these things and your plan for all history and all creation. Father, we pray for people today who are in desperate need of you in one way or the other. Maybe financially, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually. Christians who are persecuted in places that we do not even know of, but we know there are Christians who are persecuted. We pray for them. We pray for people who are in countries where there is war, in the east, in the west, in the north, in the south, in the central parts of this world. We pray that you would send them your gospel which is able to give them hope. We pray for this country of Uganda, praying that you would save those who are in leadership who have not bowed their knee to the Lordship of Jesus, that you would encourage those who are civil servants and have believed in you and are working with integrity as they do their work, that you would deliver from the snares of Satan and the chains of wickedness those who have not yet believed in you and they are walking in ways of corruption and wickedness and sin. Today, as we listen to your word about marriage, in the next few minutes, we pray that you would speak to us on what you would want us to know as Christian fathers and mothers. We thank you that we have hope in you, Christ Jesus, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Right. Children are having their service in the boardroom, and then they can break out to their various classes. They are clearly labeled on the walls. The 11 to 14-year-olds are this side, so children, you are free to walk to your classes at this point. I want to call on the ushers to collect the offerings at this point. Thank you for your kind and generous giving to add the work at One Life Church. I pray that if you are struggling financially that the Lord would provide for you. I want to remind you that we have a building fund that is running and which we talked about at the AGM and which we are collecting funds so that one day we don't have to pay rent for this facility and we can have a place of our own to meet for worship. Some of that money has been invested in unit trusts and treasury bonds and so on. And um, I ask you to dedicate a small amount of your income toward that fund. 
But thank you for the regular giving Sunday after Sunday. We have various means to give. As you can see on the television there, you can give on mobile money to a bank account. You can bring your offerings on Sunday. Or you can even come to the church office and give your offerings there and get a receipt if you would like to have a receipt for your giving. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he told them that on the first day of the week, that would be today, the Lord's Day, let each one of you lay something aside, something. It's not defined how much it is, but let every one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, as God has prospered you. And let them come and give that gladly and willingly to the Lord. Aren't you grateful that the Lord asks us to give willingly? And he doesn't um, twist anyone or manipulate anyone or force anyone or coerce anyone. He doesn't give restrictions. You can give everything. You can give something. But that every one of us has something that they can come and they can give every Sunday. Father, we pray that you would receive our offerings today as we give and that this would be used for the advancement of your work, for the glory of your name in Kampala, Uganda, and other places in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. I invite us to stand. God of everlasting wonder. God of everlasting wonder.
trust in you for all my days. All my hope. All my hope is in you. All my strength is in you. On the mountain, in the valley, from the darkest depth into the sea. Sovereign Lord, you will always be. In your arms. In your arms you hold forever. A present of a past and future you have been. And you will always be. God of everlasting wonder, you hold everything together, you have been, and you will always be. So I will. So I will never be afraid, for you are with me. I'll trust in you for all my days. All my hope is Sovereign Lord, you will always be. You have walked this road before me. You have walked this road before me. You have seen it all and shown me you have been and you will always be. If everything I stand on ceases, I fall into your arms, Lord Jesus, you are there, and you will always be. Oh, my hope is in you. Oh, my hope is in you. Oh, my strength is in you. On the mountain, the valley from the darkest depth into the sea the sovereign lord you will always be you will always be you will always be oh on the mountain on the mountain in the valley from the darkest, or on the mountain, on the mountain, in the valley, from the darkest depth, on the mountain, on the mountain, in the valley, from the darkest depth into the sea, the sovereign Lord, you will always be. Beginning to the end, you will always be. Father, you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, we adore you. We re give you reverence and worship for all the things that you've done for us, for your faithfulness, for your goodness. We thank you. Savior bled for me, 
my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that gave me life, grace flowing from the side, no greater sacrifice. Sing for the freedom. Sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Say the name. Say, say the name above all names. Over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What is done? What is done? What he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven, I praise God for what he's done. Now on the throne of majesty, now on the throne of majesty the father's will complete he reigns in victory sing sing hallelujah to the king he's worthy to receive all the worship we can bring what is done what is done what is Done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what oh what is done. What is done? What is done? All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what is done. I praise God for what is done. I praise God. For what is done. Father, we praise you for all the things that you've done for us, for your goodness, and for your mercy. We adore and we praise you. Jesus, you are my King. You are my king, Jesus. You are my king, oh Lord. You are you are my king, Jesus. You, Jesus. You are my king, you are. You are my King. Thank you, choir. You may have your seats once again. The church is always dependent on volunteers. Did you know that? You, 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 you are the church. At this point, we are having some of our tech people away. And uh, even my own wife is away on a women in ministry retreat. We don't have a drama. We need a drama. Maybe one of you can play the drums. You can volunteer and come and play the drums so that the choir can get all those beats they want since you did not clap your hands when we were singing. <laughs> um, 
So we need volunteers. If you see an area in the church where you can serve, let me know. If you've ever been stopped from serving somewhere, let me know. I'm sure it has never happened. And that's to stress the point that there is always room for everyone to serve at One Life Church. So this is the second installment of our marriage series. And um, we're inviting couples to come and sit and tell us their marriage story for a few minutes. So I'd like to invite the Kabaizas to come and, and, uh, and sit on these chairs today. And just like the Chigundus did last Sunday, we can hear a short story about their marriage. Let's appreciate them for, for their confidence to stand in front of you and, um, and talk briefly about, about their marriage. Thank you, Kabaizas, for agreeing to sit here and testify to these lovely people about your marriage before we listen to the word from Godfrey over here. So I have some questions for you, and the first one I always like to start with is, how long have you been married? Um, we made 16 years uh, last July. 16 years last July. Congratulations. Brian, what attracted you to Rita? <laughs> well, um, first of all, which young searching man would not be attracted to a very beautiful lady? <laughs> yeah, so, um, but beyond that, beyond that, I think... Um, uh, when we met, uh, Rita and I really connected. Um, we became very close friends. And um, I think I would say that um, beyond just the values, because values are identified along the way, but the most important thing is friendship. We became friends, and, and um, of course, out of that, uh, I came to appreciate a number of values in Rita. Uh, one of them is, Rita is a very godly lady. Um, so I saw this very godly person, and uh, I had accepted Christ when we met. I was still young in that life, and she helped me strengthen, hmm. and uh, I have never looked back. And so I think godliness. Stronger. Yes. Godliness. Mm. And um, the other thing is that Rita has this, these values of integrity, consistency, mm. seriousness. I think, I thought I was serious, but she's very serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever she focuses on, she will deliver. And uh, with integrity, those who know her in her industry are incredibly, um, you know, touched by her levels, the depths of integrity by which she is known in her industry. And, uh, and of course, she's an incredible mother later on, and a wife, yes. Thank you, Brian. What about you, Rita? What attracted you to Brian? Praise God, church. And uh, thank you very much, Pastor, for finding us. Uh, uh, that's the word, <laughs> for honoring us with this opportunity. It's an honor. Uh, like Brian has mentioned, we've been married for 16 years, and I bless God for the journey thus far. Uh, it has been God from day one, and it continues to be God. It's a very difficult question, uh, what attracted me to Brian. There are very many things, and I would just want to give one story. So the first date we had, I was at Sheraton, and we were supposed to meet for an evening. Uh, and of course, you expect a man to prepare for the first date, just like I had prepared. Uh, and one thing that I had learned when I was at university, that when you are going on a date with a man, you should always have money to pay for your bill, and you should always have means home, just in case things don't go right. So. <laughs> So I had prepared in that regard, and I was there in time. We had agreed to meet at a particular time. I was there in time. I like to keep time. And Brian was not there. And so I sat back and said, okay, first date. He's late. 
and I'm brought up by a father who keeps time. So I was wondering, is this it? Anyway, so I sat, I waited, and then he shows up. And when he showed up, I actually forgive him, I forgave him for being late because he was smelling really good. He was fresh. <laughs> he had taken out the time to go back home, take a shower, you know, and come and meet me for the first time. And so I said, okay, I can, I can, I can forgive his late coming. And so we had the meal, we had a very good time, and then time came to pay the bill. He picks out his wallet, and guess what? He had no money. <laughs> and those days, uh, those days POS machines were not working. There was no Momo, so you had to have cash. So he looks at the wallet, it's empty, he looks at me, I look at him, I look at the bill, and I'm thinking, what's going on with this man? Anyway, I said, I will pay the bill, because I had prepared. So I paid for our first date, can you imagine? <laughs> but what, what that really showed me was how transparent Brian is and was. And for me, I fell in love with that transparency. I fell in love with that realness. I say to myself, if this man can be this transparent on our first date, he's going to be transparent for our entire lives. And so, among many other things, Brian is transparent. And I can testify that up to today, it is what it is. Mm. He hides nothing from me. And for me, that means a lot and I fall in love with that every day. Wow. So, let me ask another question. Um, and le so let me start with Brian. What wisdom would you give to, I know you are a father, what wisdom would you give to mothers and those aspiring to be mothers? Wow. Uh, no, an easy question. But um, what I know is that uh, uh, motherhood represents this powerful, divine gift and privilege of God that has given us in co creation. Mm. And uh, with that comes a lot of um, responsibility, but also um, the, 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 the grace God gives us um, to steward whoever you've, you've been given. However, motherhood also is, um, while that gift is there and that divine uh, privilege is there, um, let me bring it for, to our own marriage. Sometimes we get married and um, of course we expect uh, if you are a, uh, a lady, you expect to be a mother. But um, many times, we take it for granted, yeah, I'll get married and be a mother and bring up children. In our own um, experience, I would do the wisdom I would give to a lady getting married, or married, probably not yet a mother, is that this privilege and gift sometimes is not necessarily um, automatic. It is not quick to be realized. Between me and Rita, when we got married, we were friends, like I said, but we waited seven years. So patience is very important. Patience in waiting. Patience and prayer for that gift. But when it comes, I have also seen that there is, there is, there is this um, responsibility that comes with motherhood. And the depth of patience, hard work, a lot of love that I've seen my wife uh, exhibit. And um, I, I would say the gift of multitasking that comes with motherhood, which, looking at what my, uh, my wife does and has done ever since our children were young, is incredible. So yes, be patient, 
accept the gift, but if it is not yet come, pray and be patient. God is always there and has privileged you for that. You only just need to pray. And when you have it, it comes with responsibility. Accept the responsibility and work hard. Um, and also, when you have those children, uh, the tendency in our communities sometimes is that uh, when a mother has one, two, three children, um, we tend to have to look to the children and not necessarily go out there and steward them by more working um, to achieve mm. what will bring them up. My wife uh, is an example. When we had our children, um, it was tough. It was tough. But after, I think, six months, uh, we sat down and decided and said, you know what? We need to go out. And I think she was, one time she was saying, no, why don't I now retain, uh, stay home and uh, look after these children, maybe for the next two years or so. And I was like, no, let's push, go back to work. And um, the results have, have shown. So mm. stewardship means love, work hard, be patient, but also um, pray and uh, bring these children in the way of God. All right, Rita. So I've interchanged this. So you, what would you tell fathers or aspiring fathers? Fatherhood is one of the greatest gifts that anybody mm. could be given. Uh, and for me, uh, whereas as a mother, I, I look at myself as a nurturer, I believe fathers are stewards. Fathers are are symbols of, of vision. They have the authority to steward, to give direction to children. They can, if a father, if a father does their bit, if a father uses the authority the right way, they have the power to determine the destiny of children. And I have seen this in my own husband. Mm. Uh, we are privileged to have, we are honored to have two boys, and I've seen the way he relates with them. Whereas I am a good mother and I, I do my bits, there are, there are bits that I cannot handle. And when I look, when I look at I, I, uh, particular aspects of, of vision, of direction, I believe that's the role of a father. And when a father does it right, I mean, I, I always tell him that I look forward to that, to, to our son's wedding days. I am so confident that they will say we are, we, we are men of valor because of our father. Wow. And that I, can, I know will happen. And, I know, and to fathers in the room, do not take your role lightly. You, you, you have the power to frame. You have the power to steward. You have the power to, to direct you have the power to, you should always look at your children and, and say, what would I want them to say of me? And remember, most of these children carry their father's names, at least in our case, our children are called Kavaiza. So I know that he has the power to frame the Kavaizas of tomorrow. I am simply there to, to assist him. So as a father, if you're in this room, it's never too late. If you've things, things you've taken some, bit, some, some of your roles lightly, you have so much authority. Use it. And that authority is God-given. Mm. Please use it the right way. The last question before we listen to the sermon from Godfrey. How does your marriage display the love and faithfulness of Christ? Um, how has our marriage uh, reflected Display. Display. Show the love and faithfulness yes. of Christ. Of Christ. Mm. Well, um, when you think about the faithful, uh, the, the faith of Christ and uh, the way of Christ, the life of Christ, what, do you, what comes in mind um, is love, is faith, is sacrifice, is overcoming temptations. And I think um, in our marriage, those features, our marriage is founded on 
Christ, uh, on features uh, uh, the way of Christ. And so um, if I look at uh, those attributes, those attributes have been the foundation of our marriage. We, in the way we relate, I said we are friends, but um, in the way we relate, we share, we, there's nothing that my wife doesn't know about me. Uh, I want to give an example of the sacrifice, the sharing, the love that we share. Many times, the issue of money is, 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 is uh, paramount and uh, a, a cause for lifts sometimes in the family or between couples. We, ever since we were married, we have overcome. Money is a tool to facilitate our life and it's not an issue in our marriage. Um, I do not have my money, she doesn't have her money. And um, many times she's more um, diligent in handling the finances. So the accounts, what, he make, what she makes and what I make mm. is shared across the board and there is no coin I keep on my account. There's no coin she keeps on her account that I don't know or we don't use. So um, the love, the sharing, the sacrifice. Sacrifice means you need to die, to be willing to die a little for your uh, mm. partner. Mm. Understand them. But also make sure that go out of your, this, uh, of your comfort to sacrifice for their comfort. Because in our marriage or in marriages, there's no one else that has your back apart from your partner. Rita, do you have anything to add? No. No. All right. Thank you so much, Kabaizas, for. Maybe some, some, some parting shots is just to everybody that is married is that please commit your marriages to God. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, he, I am in Timothy, that I'm persuaded that God is able to keep everything that is committed to him. So God can keep our marriages. Let's commit them to him. And those who are aspiring to be married, please get there. It's a beautiful journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are going through our marriage series, and I'm inviting Godfrey. So if you are new, you are visiting us, we are taking about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes to listen about stories of marriage, and then we listen to a sermon. This will happen for about eight weeks. I pray that it will be a blessing to you. If you'd like to testify, see me. I've already reached out to some of you. Um, we'll be calling all manner of people to just sit. I send the questions to you if you would like them beforehand so that you can think about them, as someone last week said, so that there are no skeletons. <laughs> so, um, so I send the questions so that you can go through them as a couple. Godfrey. Good morning, church. I think this is better. Let's appreciate Pastor Martin for all that he does. And also, let's appreciate the Kabaizas who have done a fantastic job. They went into my sermon and preached everything, and so I think all I'm left with is just collecting another offering. I like to disagree a little bit with uh, them on one note because my experience is that much as uh, husband and wife share their money and they are transparent about it, but mothers will always have some money on the side. And they use that little money to influence and, ex and, and advance their influence, especially among the boys. And so I remember a time when I was a little bit naughty as a boy, and, uh, and I remember coming home that evening, I don't know what we had messed up on in the neighborhood, and my mother gave me a thorough beating. And so I went to bed with, even without. I took a cold bath, I remember. And mothers are not so much like the fathers because 
fathers will either use their belt to cane or they will look for a good stick. And my father used to tell me, Godfrey, I'm going to give you either six canes if you have done, your offense is not so serious, but if your offense is very serious, then he says that this time I'll give you six. But mothers pick anything from anywhere. And so my mother picked a shrub and really gave me the beating. The strange thing about that cold water is because I had a few bruises on the body, it really hurt. So I went to bed, I protested by not eating food that night. But early in the morning when I was ready to go to school, my mother came with a 10 shillings note and said, now go and buy some pancakes as you go to school. That is how special mothers are. Let's appreciate the mothers that are in the house. My task this morning is to look at the desire of God for fathers and mothers. And so I will attempt to talk about the role of fathers and mothers towards each other and also their collective responsibility towards children. In the wisdom of God, he designed a family as a foundation for the church and for the nation, meaning that where there is a strong family, uh, a strong family will make strong churches and will also make a strong nation. And where there are weak families, there will be weak churches and therefore a weak nation. And therefore it is very, very important for us to understand God's intent according to his word, his design, and his plan for the family. That's why we look at Genesis chapter 1, from verse 27 to 28. The Bible says, so God created man in his image, in his image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That is the design of God, that man should be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And remember, even as the text states that he made them male and female created he them. We understand that in the beginning, God actually created Adam alone. But we could argue that in the process of creation, much as Adam was created alone, the woman was created in Adam. The Bible says, and God caused the man to sleep and took the woman out of him, and he later called the woman Eve. What made the woman different from Adam is the womb that the woman carried. And so that is what distinguishes a woman, a mother, from the man, the womb. The womb distinguishes and begins the role of a mother. Let's just put this into context according to the scripture. The Bible says, and the Lord, God caused them a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed it up, the flesh, and, and placed it in a flesh. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones, and the flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So the whole thing became, began with Adam, and out of Adam, God removed the woman. Then the man finds his wife, and he becomes a husband. 
and they become husband and wife. Then God blesses their union and they become father and mother. Because becoming a father is not obvious. Not every man is a father and not every woman or every wife is a mother. It is a special blessing and that blessing of a child qualifies you to become a father and qualifies a woman to become a mother. The separation of a woman from a man will always cause a man to have the desire to look for his woman. And for me, that happened at the age of 30. And at the age of 30, in my process of looking around, I remember uh, in my former church, my role was to be, a, I was a greeter. And so the assignment of a greeter is to wait for everybody that walked into church and greet them with a smile. And so one day, this lady walks into church wearing a light, a cream suit, and she gave me a smile. And in my heart, I said, I have found her. <laughs> and this has been 24 years since I met this lady. And that smile she gave me has always made my day every morning. When she looks at me with that smile, I feel that I feel fulfilled. Thank you so much for putting up with all my foolishness all these years. So I met her at the age of 30, 31, we got married. And six years later, she became a mother and I became a father. And that is when the journey of raising children began. So the progression is that a boy becomes a man, the man finds a wife and he becomes a husband, then the husband becomes a mother, a father by the blessing of the Lord, and the same happens to the girls, they become boys, they become ladies, and the ladies become wives, and the wives become mothers by the blessing of the Lord. Now, when a boy begins to take on the role of a father, or a girl begins to take on the role of a mother at an early child, it's called abuse. And in our day and age, we have seen a lot of that happening in society. We have seen a lot of child trafficking. Girls are being trafficked to play roles that they are not yet fit to play. And we pray that may the hand of the Lord prevail. So God's idea for a family is that there is a father and a mother raising children together. It's a pity that we are living in a world where the statistics show that there are so many uh, children that are born outside marriage, out in wed outside wedlock, unlike the former family. And the, the statistics varies from nation to nation. And that for Africa particularly intrigued me because it is the highest in the world and it stands at about 74% of the children that are born in Africa don't live in a formal setup of a family. I'd like to do some bit of uh, definitions. Uh, the word a father, a father in the context of the Bible is the same as the word Abba, which means source and sustainer. The Bible says in the book of Romans, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage against fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. God is source, and in him we have our sustenance. Even as the scripture says in the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, that in him we live, in him we move and we have our being. For purposes of clarity, I'm going to uh, bring up examples of fathers. There are five, four categories of five fathers. We have our heavenly father, our father who is in heaven. 
He is the symbol of fatherhood. And the Bible actually refers, he says that we have to emulate our father that is in heaven. So we have a father in heaven. That is the first father that we have in our lives. And we, as we build intimacy in God, that is the first father that we have. The second father we have are our biological fathers. Our biological fathers by the fact that they were the ones that carried the seed. And then, <clears throat> it's interesting that the Bible says that even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Jeremiah 1.5, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. So we have our heavenly father. We have got our physical father. We also have spiritual fathers, especially in the faith. God has given a special place for our spiritual fathers. And I would like, I know that the context is that our pastors, all the people that disciple us and bring us to the knowledge of God, the people that, to whom we run for spiritual counsel and guidance, many times become our spiritual fathers. But I would like to challenge fathers in the house if your children, your sons and daughters can begin to look to you as spiritual fathers, it is a very, very important and powerful privilege. As fathers, we are challenged to step up so that instead of outsourcing everything that pertains to godliness, to pastors and elders and decals and church and, uh, and children's church coordinators, as fathers, it is important that we begin to take on the role of raising our daughters and our, our sons in the ways of God. Every father would be so proud for his own father. Every son would be so proud. Every father would be so proud for his own sons and daughters to refer to them as a spiritual father. I remember in my life when my daughter and my son were being baptized, I had the privilege of getting into the water with the pastor and seeing them through the process of being baptized. It's exciting for me to follow up even in our family altar to understand the health and the state at which our children are doing as they walk in the ways of God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, um, Paul said, My little children, for whom I labor in birth until Christ is formed in you. That is a statement made by a spiritual father. Then another set of fathers that we later have in life are our parents-in-law. Our fathers-in-law, by reason of marriage, actually take on a father figure in our lives as men. And our mothers-in-law take on a mother's figure in our lives. We see a relationship between Moses and Jethro. Jethro was a priest of Midian, and Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. At a time when Moses was fulfilling his assignment of bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had they say there were arguably over two, two million people that were being led by Moses from Egypt to the promised land. And he took on that burden by himself, and he had no life for himself until his father-in-law Jethro comes and says, Hey, Moses, you will kill yourself. Why don't you choose 70 men from the tribes, among, from the men from the different tri tribes, and appoint them, give them responsibility, pray for them. And we see Moses praying for these 70 men. And the same spirit that was upon Moses became imparted upon these men, and Moses' life became easy. That is a counsel that came from Moses' father-in-law. And so we really appreciate our parents-in-law. For those who still have them alive, make sure that you... Uh, Bring them close to yourself. 
So I'm going to talk about the expectations of God towards a father and mother towards each other. The first responsibility of a father to a mother from a biblical perspective is to love. To love. Fathers have got to show the mother's love. I thought I would get a smile from the sisters, that are, the mothers that are in the house. God commands the men to love their wives, and that is their number one responsibility according to the Word of God. The Bible says in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word. And and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands, again, ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And for this reason, again, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What is to love? And God, according to the word, sets standards for love. The Bible says, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love suffers. Every man can say amen to that, that there is a lot of suffering in love. Love suffers long, and it's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. Not, it's not provoked. Love thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, keeping records of wrong, the mistakes that have been done by your wife. Love does not keep records of wrong, but rejoices in truth, bears things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, because love never fails. The responsibility of wives to, towards their husbands, according to the Bibles, Ephesians 5.22, is that wives submit to your own husbands as, the, as unto the Lord. For the husband is head over the wife as Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the, as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be, let the wives be their own husbands, let the wives, so let the wives be to their husbands, own ha let the wives, I beg your pardon, be to their own husbands in everything. Amen. I'd like to refer briefly to the roles of the father, some of it. Uh, the Kabaizas actually did a fantastic illustration and gave a practical testimony. Um, the role of both father and mother is actually to provide. The first role is to provide. This we see illustrated very well in the book of Timothy, chapter 5, from verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he denies the faith and is worse than the non-unbeliever. And so the first role of the husband is to provide. The second role of the husband is to protect. The best example according to the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 2 from verse 13 to 15. This is the role that Joseph played. I'd like to say that the role that Joseph and Mary played 
in the birth and the bringing up of Jesus is really an example that we cannot underestimate because of the circumstances. This is a couple that was planning and intending to get married, but God comes and interrupts their program. God comes and interrupts their program, and they began walking in very challenging circumstances. Mary becomes pregnant by the Holy Ghost. This had never happened before. This is a very peculiar and unique situation. But Joseph took on the role of protecting. The first protection he did was to protect Mary from embarrassment, from disgrace. And so, at a critical time, when Herod the king wanted to destroy this family that was coming together, that was carrying Jesus as their son, the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and says, Depart from where you are. Rise up, take the child, take the mother, and go to Egypt. And they stayed in Egypt until Herod died. I mean, that is, there cannot be any example as good as that as protection that a father can play in the, as, as a protector. So the role of a father is to protect the children that God has given to them in every way. And Joseph did that very well without disgracing Mary. And I like to bring up the example of Mary as a mother who is so powerful and very influential at that. Mary, at a little age of 14 years, gets this visitation from an angel. Imagine a 14-year-old getting a visitation. I imagine my daughter, when she was still 14, I don't think she could have actually put up with that responsibility, but I believe it was the grace of God that to accept a being coming and telling you all kinds of, all, all manners of, of things that you're going to give birth to a child without knowing a husband, she decided to take on that responsibility. That is how powerful mothers are. Mothers go through a lot of things to bring up children. Mothers have got a special grace I have seen some mothers, they can be pregnant for over six months, but you can hardly see the pregnancy. If they choose and they make up their mind to keep up a pregnancy, they can do everything. They can literally starve themselves to hide the pregnancy. They can choose to dress in a particular way until it is time to bring forth that child. So God has put a very special grace upon the mothers to be able to protect that which God is doing in them. So that is a special grace that God has put upon mothers, and we really uphold Mary for that, that she did as far as uh, the journey of the life of Jesus is concerned. The other responsibility that is collective upon parents is the training up of children. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that they ought to go, and when they are old, they shall not depart from that way. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up, training and admonishing them in the ways of the Lord. There is a quotation I would like to bring from Frederick Douglass. He says, it is easier to build a strong child than to repair a weak man. It is easier to build a strong child than to repair a weak man. Many men are not really men per se because of the training they had as ch uh, children. And no wonder many of them end up behind bars and they are in the prison because of weak families and because their upbringing was difficult and therefore repairing weak men 
is a very difficult task. The Bible, God brags about Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, uh, verses 17 to 18. He says, Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him, for I know him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the ways of the Lord and to do righteously, and to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken. So God is boasting in the ability and the trust that he has on Abraham upon the capability that Abraham has to bring up his household in the ways of God and to raise up his children in the ways of God. And the Bible refers to us as children of Abraham because Abraham is known to be the father of faith. Fatherhood is modeled to children. And therefore, children emulate their parents. Daughters emulate their mothers. The behavior of their parents always become milestones in their lives, and they are always reference points to them as they grow up in the journey of life. I'd like, for emphasis for sake, I'd like to bring out one important role of a father. The father, God has given parents a special role as priests of the family. And I want to challenge every husband in this place, every father in this place, to rise up to that responsibility of being a priest over your household. I see the example of Job in the Bible, Job chapter 1. The Bible says Job was a righteous man in the east. He was a blessed man. He had substance. He had ten children. But because the children would party, many times Job took on the responsibility of ensuring that he has to make a special sacrifice to the Lord so that the hand of the Lord will not send judgment over the children but will protect the children. There is a divine grace and covering up that comes when a father takes his position in a family. Someone say amen. When a father takes his position in the family, there is a special protection that comes upon that family. And so it is important for us as men to rise to our responsibility and be the priests of our homes to lead our wives, to lead our children, lead that family altar, lead that, facilitate that Bible class in your home. Pray for your children, and there will be a protection upon that family in the name of Jesus. These were the words of Satan to God when God, when Satan found himself before the throne of God. And these were the words of Satan to God. This is what uh, the Bible says. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? Listen to this. God had made a hedge around the household of Job and around his household. And all that he has on every side, you have blessed the works of his hand, and you have blessed his possessions, and you have caused him to increase in the land. I believe this protection came because Job took his position as a priest over his family. And so that is a very crucial and very important role of a father and a mother in the family. We all know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, the Bible recalls, that decided to step out of the covering of the father. 
and he decided to ask for his inheritance, and he went to have a riotous life out there until it came to his senses. I don't think this guy was not smart. I don't think this guy was not skilled. I believe he had fantastic ideas. But then, thriving many times is because we have submitted ourselves under a special grace of a father. And therefore, when men take their roles and pray for their children, pray for their family, God will ensure that that family remains blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. As I conclude, I'd like to just give one example of the influence of mothers over their children. Uh, the Bible gives us a very important and interesting example of the life of Timothy. Tim Second Timothy chapter, chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, when I call to remembrance I, uh, the faith that it was in your mother Eunice and that dwelt in your grandmother I am persuaded in this also. Paul is referring to the grace that came upon Timothy. We all know Timothy was a disciple of Paul, the apostle, and Paul, Timothy was one of the first pastors of the church at Ephesus. But Paul realizes and recognizes the grace that was upon Timothy and the faith that was in Timothy because of the prayers and the teachings of their mother. And therefore, there is a very important role that mothers have in raising up their children in the ways of the Lord. I remember so well, as I was growing up, I never ever saw my father say a prayer. I have, my father has ever gone to church with me I come from a Catholic background, and my father would take us to church every Easter and every Christmas day. And many times we'd reach late to church and stay outside the church. But it was okay to make the sign of the cross, and you feel that you've been to church. But real prayer in my life was the influence of my mother. Real prayer in my life was the influence of my mother. And I continue really blessing the Lord for who my mother was. My mother was there to see that we grow up in the ways of the Lord. In our own way, in our own understanding, she taught us to pray. And therefore, as I conclude, I believe that the desire of God towards fathers and mothers is that, number one, they should Show love to one another. Husbands, love your wives. Women, you have been raised by God to be helpers to your husbands. Walk alongside your husbands. Secondly, raise up your children in the ways of God by providing for them, by creating an environment that is conducive, an environment that propagates the ways of the Lord, and then Invest in their education so that they will be able to be responsible citizens in the nations. When we have strong families, we will have strong churches and we shall have a strong nation. The Lord bless you so much. Let us pray. According to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says that he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and I struck the earth with a curse. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, this prophetic word upon every family that is represented here, every husband, every wife, I pray that, Lord, you will cause the hearts of the fathers to return to their children. I pray, Lord, if there is a husband or a man in this place that has abdicated their responsibility as a father, I pray in the name of Jesus that in a special way, wherever they are, 
that you will touch their hearts and begin to draw their hearts to their sons and daughters. And I pray for every mother in this place that, Lord, they will rise up to their responsibility by your grace, that they will do that you have called them to do, that they will be priests in their homes and raise up all the children in the ways of the Lord. In Jesus' name I prayed. Amen. Invite us to stand.
Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Let's share the words of the grace, and now may the grace our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us all now and forevermore.